Woodland Countries by William Cobbett. I cannot quit battle without observing that the country is very pretty all about it, all hill or valley. A great deal of woodland in which the underwood is generally very fine, though the oaks are not very fine and a good deal covered with moss. This shows that the clay ends before the tap root of the oak gets as deep as it would go. For when the clay goes the full depth, the oaks are always fine. The woods are too large and too near each other for hare hunting. And as to coursing, it's out of the question here. But it is a fine country for shooting and for harboring game of all sorts. It was rainy as I came home, but the woodmen were at work. A great many hop holes are cut here, which makes the coppices more valuable than in many other parts. The women work in the coppices, shaving the bark of the hop poles, and indeed at various other parts of the business. Little boys and girls shave hop poles and assist in other coppice work very nicely. And it is pleasant work when the weather is dry overhead. The woods, buried with leaves as they are, are clean and dry underfoot. They are warm too, even in the coldest weather. When the ground is frozen several inches deep in the open fields, it is scarcely frozen at all in a coppice where the underwood is a good plant and where it is nearly high enough to cut. So that the woodman's is really a very pleasant life. We are apt to think that the birds have a hard time of it in winter, but we forget the warmth of the woods which far exceeds anything to be found in farmyards. Woodland countries are interesting on many accounts, not so much on account of their masses of green leaves as on account of the variety of sights and sounds and incidents that they afford. Even in winter, the coppices are beautiful to the eye, while they comfort the mind with the idea of shelter and warmth. In spring, they change their hue from day to day during two whole months, which is about the time from the first appearance of the delicate leaves of the birch to the full expansion of those of the ash. And even before the leaves come at all to intercept the view, what in vegetable creation is so delightful to behold as the bed of a coppice bespangled with primroses and bluebells? The opening of the birch leaves is the signal for the pheasant to begin to crow, for the blackbird to whistle and the thrush to sing. And just when the oak buds begin to look reddish, and not a day before, the whole tribe of finches burst forth in songs from every bough, while the lark imitating them all carries the joyous sounds to the sky. These are amongst the means which Providence has been benignantly appointed to sweeten the toils by which food and raiment are produced. These the English ploughman could once hear without sorrowful reflection that he himself was a pauper and that the bounties of nature had for him been scattered in vain. And shall he never see an end to this state of things? Shall he never have the due reward of his labour? Shall unsparing taxation never cease to make him a miserable, dejected being? a creature famishing in the midst of abundance, fainting, expiring with hunger's feeble moans, surrounded by a caroling creation. Oh, accursed paper money! Has hell a torment surpassing the wickedness of thy inventor? From Priestley's emigrant, the pot shop, in a pot shop, well stocked with wares of all sorts, a discontent unluckily bore the sway. One day, after the mortifying neglect of several customers, Gentlemen, said he, addressing himself to his brown brethren in general, Gentlemen, with your permission, we are a set of tame fools, without ambition, without courage, condemned to the vilest uses. We suffer all without murmuring, let us dare to declare ourselves, and we shall soon see the difference. That superb earth, these gilded jars, vases, china, and in short all those elegant nonsenses whose colour and beauty have neither weight nor solidity, must yield to our strength and give place to our superior merit. 
this civic harangue was received with applause, and the pitcher, chosen president, some, however, more moderate than the rest, attempted to calm the minds of the multitude. But all the vulgar utensils, which shall be nameless, were becoming intractable. Eager to vie with the bowls and the cups, they were impatient almost to madness to quit their obscure abodes, to shine upon the table, the lip and ornament the cupboard. In vain did a wise water jug, some say it was a platter, make them a long and serious discourse upon the utility of their vocation. Those, said he, who are destined to great employments are rarely the most happy. We are all of the same clay, it is true, but he who made us formed us for different functions. One is for ornament, another for use. The posts, the least important, are often the most necessary. Our employments are extremely different, and so are our talents. This had a most wonderful effect. The most stupid began to open their ears. Perhaps it would have succeeded if a grease pot had not cried out in a decisive tone, You reason like an ass! To the devil with you and your silly lessons! Now the scale was turned. All the hordes of pans and pitchers applauded the superior eloquence and reasoning of the grease pot. In short, they determined on an enterprise. But a dispute arose who should be the chief. Everyone would command, but no one obey. It was then you might have heard a clatter. All put themselves in motion at once, and so wisely and with such so much acted that the whole was soon changed, not into China, but into rubbish.